Today, I'd like to demonstrate a little bit of what you can do with uh, Groovy scripting within QPath. This isn't a exact recording of, of the session that happened in the workshop. Uh, that one was interrupted with many great questions, um, but so many that it was actually too hard to edit into a cohesive video, so we decided to re-record. Uh, the other benefit of doing it as a, a new recording is that you can uh, see my screen and how I usually set up uh, my scripting environment through IntelliJ. So let me uh, jump into QPath so that you can follow along. So what we have here is a piece of liver, and this was stained with um, a few immune markers. In blue is DAPI and in red is Lysix-G. And what you can see very clearly is that there's this edge artifact where all of the cells over here are uh, brighter than all of the cells in the background over here. Um, I've already run cell detection. If we were to try to set a simple threshold uh, um, to find the positive cells, we wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, let me demonstrate what that looks like. I'm going to turn on cell boundaries. I'm going to try to make a quick threshold um, using just the uh, cell AF647 channel. So AF647 channel. Um, Um, so we can set a threshold that looks pretty good on um, in this region. And I'd say overall, that looks pretty reasonable, at least as good as my segmentation is, which is which is by no means perfect. Um, but if we move to the other side of the tissue, the entire right side, um, all of the cells along the entire right side are positive. And if we were to try to raise the threshold so that we didn't get these cells, um, we would lose all of the positive cells over on the left. Um, so the way we're going to have to deal with this is to find a way to account for this background staining um, and either subtract it or divide it out from um, each cell's measurements. Uh, this is actually the same problem that Zwigniew mentioned in his artifacts video. Um, and there he talks a little bit about how to remove this edge of artifacts through proper fixation. Uh, this is uh, fixing the tissue preparation in the first place is always better than trying to quantify your way around a, an artifact, but we don't always have control over sample prep, and sometimes you just have to work with what you've got. All right, so uh, we need to write a script that gets rid of this background artifact. I actually like to do scripting for QPath in IntelliJ. There are uh, resources online in the QPath Read the Docs on how to set up IntelliJ such that it can access the QPath source code. Um, if you don't want to go through that process, uh, everything I'm showing here can absolutely be done through the QPath script editor. It's just a little less convenient and uh, the script editor doesn't do things like color code and point out mistakes and debug for you. Um, so I'm going to drag a blank text file called Edge Artifacts into IntelliJ. Um, right now there's nothing in it. Um, and I always like to start with some uh, standard import statements. And the easiest way to get them is actually through the QPath script editor. So if you just go to imp uh, insert imports QP and insert imports QPEX, -E um, this is the basic QPath library and the extended QPath library. And these two lines combined get you a lot of what you need for many things inside QPath scripting. So I'm going to copy them and paste them right at the top of my edge artifacts .gruby script. OK. Um, next, we need to actually measure the um, background artifact around every cell. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go to um, uh, select, select detections, select cells. Um, and you can see these are all highlighted. And then analyze, calculate features, add intensity features. Um, by default, when you um, load up this window, um, it, it assumes you want to measure the region of interest. But instead, I want to measure a circular tile um, with a diameter of 25 microns around each region of interest. And I'm going to use my preferred pixel size of the actual image pixel size, which in this case is 0 0.325. And I'm just going to select all the channels and select mean. And hit run. 
uh, process all selected objects. Yes, hit OK. This will just take a second. Um, so to demonstrate what this does is it draws a circle. That's five microns. Um, uh, 25 microns. Um, so it effectively calculates the average intensity in this region and assigns it to the cell in this region and assigns it to the cell in this region and assigns it to the cell and so on. And now um, in every cell we can see in the annotations tab uh, that we have, um, first of all, measurements of the mean intensity in every channel that came by default in, in cell detection, and then also mean intensity in all the channels in a circular uh, region. Um, so back to IntelliJ. Um, we know we want to be working with cells. So the first thing I'm going to do is just grab my cell objects. And to do that, I just go depth cells equals get cell objects. And you can see in IntelliJ, as you start to type, it uh, auto suggests. Uh, this define depth um, is a, a way of initializing variables in Groovy where you don't need to specify exactly what type of variable it is, it will try to figure it out from context. Um, and if you hover over uh, this function, usually it works, but of course it's not right now. Yes, you can say, see that um, get cell objects produces a collection of path object uh, objects. Okay. Um, and then we're going to need to loop over every cell to do some math. Um, if you've done any programming in Java or MATLAB or Python or basically many, many languages, you have written a thousand times a script that looks like this. Um, from uh, i equals zero to i is less than cell slash size, i plus plus, and then all cells. This is your standard for loop. It's in every language. One of my absolute favorite things about Groovy is that it makes this so much easier. You can just do cells dot h. Um, and now this will loop through um, this whole list of cells. Um, and for every loop, to call um, the specific instance, you just say it. Um, so right now, the I could say the individual cell that I'm looking at is it. And that's it. Um, you don't need to keep track of indices or anything like that. Um, so we're working with the cell measurements. Um, and if you just type it dot uh, group, IntelliJ automatically suggests that you want measurements. And you could go through all of the different functions that are available. Um, uh, for this object, but basically, yes, I want measurements. Uh, um, this should be up here anyway. And I, I want the um, um, I want to subtract the um, cell mean minus the background mean. And the way you use this measurements uh, list um, is just by uh, calling it with the string name um, inside brackets. And the easiest way to get the string name is just copy paste. So I'm going to pick one cell, go down to cell uh, AF647 mean, because I'm looking at the, that chat ball, and just right click copy and paste. And when you paste it, it, <laughs> it includes um, the actual measurement value for the cell, and I don't want that, so I'm just going to delete that and put this inside quotation marks to make it a string. So overall, this calls the value of, of um, the 647 mean intensity in every cell. 
And from that, I'm going to subtract to the background intensity. And again, this is it dot measurements. Uh, scroll all the way down. And in uh, for this one, I really highly recommend you copy paste instead of trying to write it out because this uh, micron symbol here, um, it, it's very finicky about um, uh, about this micron symbol. Um, you can't just write you. It needs to be that exact symbol and that exact font. So it's easier to just copy it than to like, remember how to type it from. <laughs> So now I'm uh, doing the subtraction, and I'm going to call this the difference. Um, and I'm just going to specify that it's a double because eh, why not? You could also just use def. It, it doesn't really matter. I just like to be um, clear about it when I can be. Um, honestly, with this type of artifact, um, this like edge artifact, I'm never sure whether it's an additive or multiplicative artifact. Um, so whether the um, whether we should be subtracting this background or dividing by this background. So I'm going to just calculate them both, and we'll deal with it later. Um, so I'm going to just copy paste this whole line, all this ratio, and instead of subtracting, divide. OK, uh, now we've done the math, but we need to now reapply those values um, into the measurement list of every cell. Um, um, and you do, you add to the measurement list in the exact same way you read from it. So I'm just going to go it.measurements um, and give it a brand new name. I'm going to call this background difference. Oops. And let's do the same thing with Geo. Let's save this. So I've saved the file. And then I'm going to drag that file into QPAP, and it's going to open. And let's run this and see what happens. A control all R to run. Uh, it runs pretty fast. Um, so now we can click on any cell and see, yep, it's got um, the difference and the ratio in background. OK, let's see which one actually, let's see if this actually helps. Um, let's try to create a thresholder and see if it helps. And Okay, let's start over here and find a setting that gets all or most of the positive cells. That looks good. What it's what it's showing up as purple overall looks pretty reasonably positive. It's not perfect. My segmentation isn't perfect. Be a little bit lower. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Over here, overall, over here, it looks good. And let's go to the right side of the tissue. And eh, that doesn't look great. Maybe it needs to be a little higher. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, yeah, now it's looking. It's looking a lot more reasonable, where it's the purples are marking um, the positive cells for the most part. Oh, that's too high. Um, if you zoom out, you can see that there's still a line of um, uh, classified positive cells right at the edge of the tissue. And that's because when it's, um, uh, and th these are often false positive, and that's because when it's doing that 25 diameter, 25 micron diameter circle, it's getting some of this true true negative, like, like true black background. 
and that's affecting the um, the calculations of the background intensity. So this isn't a perfect method. As, as I mentioned, it's always better to fix your sample prep than to try to map your way out of an artifact. Um, but at least it's, it's far more accurate than it was. Um, and just for completeness, let's look at the background ratio. Let's adjust that a little. Find a good spot. Um, how does this look? Actually, that looks pretty, also pretty good. Um, yeah, uh, both background difference and background ratio seem to be improving the accuracy of the classifier. Um, uh, this bottom portion also has some of the false um, false positives because it, it, it collected some like true zeros in, in part as part of the background. Um, oh, that's interesting. Well, the, uh, the these vessels look a lot better, uh, look, look a lot more accurate when I'm using the difference instead of the ratio. So in this particular case, I would go with subtraction instead of division, though you really have to uh, think about what's causing your artifact um, before you make that decision. That's not, um, and that's not universally true. Okay, now we've saved that. Um, so overall, this script does exactly what we need, but um, we can actually make it a lot more functional um, in a couple of ways. Uh, first, we might as well include um, the computing the intensity features right in the script. That way we don't uh, ever forget to do that accidentally. So I'm going to um, go to the workflow tab and uh, find the line where I selected all of the cells. Right click, copy, um, go back to uh, my script editor and put that at the top. And then do the same thing with computing the intensity features in the circular tile. So I have that. Um, since I already did it, and I don't want to accidentally rerun um, the uh, calculation of intensity features because it takes a long time, I'm going to just comment it out. But at least I know it's there. And um, this way, I always know that I wanted a, a 25 micron uh, circle with 0.33 micron pixel size. Um, the other thing we might want to do with a script like this, um, and oh, by the way, as soon as you uh, save in IntelliJ, it just automatically updates inside the QPath uh, script editor. They're, they're linked. The other thing you might want to do with a, a script like this is look at other channels. Um, we've been looking at the AF647 channel, but the, the green channel um, also shows the exact same edge artifact. Uh, and interestingly, the size 7 channel actually shows an almost inverse artifact where the edges are dimmer, but the middle of the tissue um, is a lot brighter with, with this like nebulous background staining that's everywhere. Um, that makes it a little hard to find the true positive cells. Um, so if we, if we wanted to um, change that in the script, what we could do is go back here and everywhere it says 647, uh, um, change it. Uh, everywhere it says 647, delete that, write in the new uh, channel name and, um, and just do that over and over for every channel. But that can get annoying and is very error prone if you miss any of the spaces or any of the um, capitalization or anything, it's going to throw an error. So instead, I'm going to try to just use string processing uh, to uh, do it in a slightly more uh, efficient way. So I'm going to make a new variable called channel name. And at first, I'm going to call it AF647. Um, and I'm going to spell it right uh, because that's important. And then anywhere in here that I see AF647, 
I'm going to del I'm going to end the string, write plus panel name, um, and rebegin the string. And this is another nice feature of Ruby that isn't true in a bunch of other languages. That, uh, you certainly couldn't do this in MATLAB. Um, where to concatenate strings, it's just plus, um, and you don't have to do anything particularly fancy um, to just to um, to replace uh, char string characters with a variable. Um, so I'm going to copy paste this, and everywhere where I, where I see 647, I'm going to replace it with plus channel name. I don't know why when I paste the the quotation marks, it decides to to try to escape them for me. I think it's trying to be helpful, but I don't super love that feature. Um, and then in the measurement names, we also need to include which channel we're looking at. Um, so I'm going to write that here. Let's say this. Go over here. Again, it automatically updates. And hit run. Um, and now in every cell, we should have, yes, um, the AF6, a me measurement specifically called AF647 background difference. Um, and in this case, it has the same values as before because it's the same channel. But we can uh, just right here go A535 button. And now it's got that as well. And side seven. Um, so now we could easily calculate a threshold for um, all of three channels just by changing a couple of strings. All right. All right, uh, here's an example of uh, the type of thing you can do with scripting that you actually can't do with the standard user interface. What I have here is a small crop of the large Orion tonsil data set. Uh, this image has 20 channels, but for now what we're looking at is uh, uh, B cells in blue, CD4 cells in green, and um, CD8 cells in pink. And what I want to do is classify those two, uh, those three types of cells. And so I've um, already uh, performed a segmentation via Stardust. Um, and you can see real quick that it, it does a pretty good job, though uh, tonsil is so, so, so dense that it's almost impossible to get the segmentation exactly right. Um, I also already made a uh, CD20 classifier for B cells. Um, and if we just look at the B cells here, you can see it does a pretty reasonable job of finding the B cells. Um, and separately, I made a classifier that does uh, CD4 and CD8 cells, which we could apply here classifier and switch to the T cells. Um, and again, it, it does a pretty good job. The CD4 cells are in dark red, the CD8 cells are in pink, um, and the, the red cells are the neither, um, which we can hide like that. And so a, a good enough job given um, that I spent all of three minutes on it. Um, if I try to apply both of these so that I get my B cells and my two types of T cells, which I can do through this, um, you can see in the results, I see 2,200 B cells, 1,900 CD4s, 700 CD8s, but also over 1,000 uh, cells that are, uh, come up as both CD20 positive and one of the T cell markers positive. And um, that's in large part due to the um, uh, errors in my segmentation, or possibly errors in my classifier. In this particular case, I'm only looking at uh, three classes, so it's not too big of a deal to just kind of ignore or, in my head, reclassify um, these mark um, these cells that I know for sure to be incorrect. But as we get more and more markers, these errors start to accumulate. Uh, this image has something like 18 markers, 
And so the number of impossible classes just rose exponentially with the uh, number of markers you have to the point where this list can actually become overwhelmed with um, more impossible classes than uh, the classes you're actually looking for. So it would be really great if we could apply the CD20 classifier um, and then only select the B cell negative, the non B cells, um, and then apply the T cell classifier. Uh, but unfortunately, within the user interface, there isn't a way of doing that. And we can do either one or the other or both at the same time, but not, um, but there's no way of doing it like hierarchically, like I just described. Uh, so let's write a script that can do that. Before, I'd like to open up my script, ed script editor and start by um, importing some just uh, real basic import statements. Um, and then go into IntelliJ and open up a brand new file uh, with nothing in it and copy paste uh, these import statements. Then let's uh, let's rerun the CD20 classifier. Where was it? Here. Um, so I'm going to copy this and run the CD20 classifier. I want to uh, separate out the B cells from the CD20 negative cells, um, and then I'll proceed with the negative cells. So I'm gonna start by uh, grabbing all of my cell objects like this, um, and then I'm gonna find the B cells. And for that, I'm gonna look uh, within the list of all cells, and I'm going to find all of the individual cells that have the class CD20. And to find them, I'm going to go to it, uh, dot every cell. I'm going to look through its hack class, which is the class I've named, um, and find the ones uh, that are labeled CD20. Um, so once again, this says look through all of the cells and find the one, the individual cells where their classification, which in QPath is called their path class is equal to CD20. And these are beasts. To find all of the uh, CD20 negative cells, I'm going to do basically the same thing. I'm in fact I'm just going to copy and paste that. Um, but instead of looking for the ones that are called CD20, I'm going to look for the ones that don't have any class at all. The cells in QPath that are uh, unclassified, so they're, they're, they're this none class, um, or you can see um, in this list, when I click on it, their class is just blank. You can find them by just looking for it.getPathClass class equals null. And these are the non B cells. Now that I found my non B cells, um, I need to tell QPath which classifier we're going to apply to that. And we do that through load object classifier. Um, and I could just type in the name, which I believe I called C4, C8. Let me go back to QPath and check. Yeah, it is important to get this name exactly right with all of the capitals and the underscore and everything. Um, so I'm going to load the object classifier C4, C8, and I'm going to call that T cell class. Okay, now that I've loaded the classifier, I can call it again. Um, and uh, hit dot and IntelliJ suggests some things that I might want to use. And in this particular case, I want to use classify objects. Um, and there's a couple of different types of classify objects, which you can see as I'm highlighting here. One uh, just calls the entire image data, which is basically the in everything that's going on in uh, this file. Um, but the other uh, version, if I hit down, um, calls image data, but also calls a specific uh, collection of path objects. And that's the one I want to use. So I'm going to hit um, tab just to um, load that. And then for the moment, I'm just going to type in image data. We haven't uh, used, we haven't defined that variable yet, but we'll get there. Um, hit comma. And then um, it's asking me which objects would I like to um, apply this classifier to, and I'm gonna call that, say I want to apply it to the non B cells. Um, and yes, I want to reset the existing class. 
Um, so it's telling me that I never actually defined image data. So I'm going to go up one line and define image data equals get current image data. And, um, okay, I defined the D cells, but I actually don't need them for anything. So I'm just going to comment that out because we don't need it. Uh, let's um, save this, go back into QF. And uh, load load this file and run it. See what happens. Ah, okay. Let's see how it looks. Now, if I go into the annotations tab, it's telling me thirty three hundred total B cells. Sorry, nineteen hundred CD four is seven hundred total CD eights. Um, these are the numbers that we got before. Um, but now all of the cells that had been uh, both CD20 and something else have been reclassified as just B cells, and we don't see any of the uh, impossible combinations. Uh, this is a convenient script for uh, cleaning up your final results, but I do want to caution that it can be dangerous to do something like this. Um, when we saw the, the messier results, the ones that we had known mistakes, we could at least get a sense of uh, of the magnitudes of the errors. Um, we knew that there must be something wrong that I was uh, finding C4, CD20 cells. But in this case, we just magically don't see it, um, which certainly does not mean that suddenly my segmentation is so perfect that there's absolutely no, uh, there's no artifacts. It's just not in our data. Um, so you only want to do this when you're absolutely certain of what you're looking at and you're already confident in your um, in your segmentation, in your classifiers, um, and um and and you already like know what your error rate really is. Uh, I'd also like to point out that it didn't in any way make a choice between whether whether those artifacts were either B cells or T cells because of we applied the classifiers in a certain order, it just used that order. Anything that was CD20 is a B cell, period. It didn't make any further decisions. Um, so you want to use something, a script like this, carefully, but it can uh, really help clean up your data at the end. All right, I have one more example here of a script that can make your life a little bit easier and save you some time. This script is a little bit more complicated than what we've done before. In total, what we're going to do is uh, make some regions, name them, and export them at, um, so that you could view them in other programs like uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the script is composed of a couple of different parts, each of which individually I end up using pretty routinely for other purposes. So let's get started. This is a crop of an H&E stained uh, Swiss wool. And let's say I wanted to um, mark a couple of regions, one on every layer of the intestine and export those uh, regions to view elsewhere. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, draw some rectangles. For the moment, it doesn't exactly matter where, um, but obviously on your project, you're very much going to care about that. And then the first thing I want to do is actually name uh, these regions. Uh, so let's get started in the script editor and go to uh, uh, first start uh, by calling all of my annotation objects. Um, and this part should feel familiar by now. From here, the general way in which you would name everything is to use a, a loop, um, like the dot each statement. Um, so you would go annex.h um, it dot set name um, and then type something here. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the way you have to set up it, it would give every annotation the exact same name. And I want to have some sort of increasing increment to name them uh, regions one, two, three, four, five. Um, and for that, we actually need to bring back in the index variable um, that this dot each so uh, neatly hides. Um, and so I'm going to um, change from dot each to dot each with index. Um, and this way, uh, Groovy will give you both the object that you're looping over 
the, the object within the lister of looping over and the uh, counter. Um, but once you have the with each, you actually can't use it anymore. You need to specify what you're going to call um, each annotation. Um, and in this case, it's just going to be, uh, we're going to call it anno, and we're also going to call the indexing variable IDX. Um, so the way to use this each with index is you give the object you're looping over a name, comma, the index, a name, comma, and then an arrow. Um, and then instead of it, I'm going to type out. And instead of set name, I'm going to type IDX. Um, but the indexing variable is an integer. The name has to be a string. So we're going to convert it to a string with dot to string. All right, let's run this. Control R. Um, so it successfully gave everything a name. Um, and the they're named at 0, 1, 4, 2, 3. And this is a really common thing that happens in QPath. You can't assume that internally QPath is keeping track of the order in which you made objects or the obvious order that they should, um, that would just make sense if they were in. Um, once you have this, this uh, list from get annotation objects, you should pretty much assume it's random. So and in this case, it would make a lot more sense to label them from top to bottom. So we're going to have to proactively sort this annotation list to make that happen. And from here, I'm actually going to move into IntelliJ uh, to make sure I don't make any mistakes. Um, so I'm going to just insert the import statements here and then copy this into IntelliJ. Thank you, my nicely prepared blank file. So I want to sort by the um, from top to bottom, which means by the y coordinate. Um, and so I'm going to use the two sorted function, anotes dot two sorted. Um, and then uh, the way this works is it sorts this list based on whichever measurement I'm about to give it. And in this case, uh, to call the y coordinate, um, it's it dot get region of interest dot uh, get centroid y. Uh, you can replace this with uh, obviously centroid x would be easier, would be e uh, better in some cases, or maybe area or uh, anything else you could think of, um, whatever makes sense for your project. Um, the two sorted does not work in place, it creates a new variable. So we're going to have to give that a name, and I'm going to call it anox sorted. Um, and now Instead of uh, looping over anodes, we're going to loop over anodes sorted. Let's uh, drag that in. And oh, now it has renamed uh, the boxes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 from top to bottom. I want to just change a couple of things. Um, first, I don't want them to just have a single number. I want them to have um, some words in there too. So I'm going to call them region. Um, and I don't want it to start at zero. I want it to start at one. Uh, so I'm going to reference IDX plus one. Very nice. Now we've got region one, region two, region three, region four, region five. Next up, it's time to actually uh, export these regions. And there's a lot of different ways of exporting images in QPath by scripting. Um, the best reference I've found is actually the read the docs document. Um, so if you go to qpath.readthedocs.io and search export by scripting, it gives you gives you some of these example um, scripts. And uh, the first one writes the full image, which is not what we want. And the next uh, two write only the image region, um, which is what we want. This one, um, this one, it, we're actually requesting the full image just at a down sample. And in this particular one, we're requesting a specific region of interest. Um, and then we're going to just write that region. And so that's one that we want to um, base the rest of our script off of. So I'm going to 
uh, uh, copy this uh, and paste it here. And then from here, adapt it um, to uh, more specifically fit exactly what, what we want. So first, uh, the first line it has is get selected ROI. So in this case, um, uh, this particular uh, bit of code is assuming you uh, clicked on one region and you're just interested in, in exporting that. Um, but that's not going to work for us. We want to export all the regions one by one. Um, so I'm going to redefine uh, this ROI um, line. And I want that ROI equals each anode dot ROI, uh, sorry, dot get ROI. Um, and we need to do this inside a loop. Um, so we're going to go anodes sorted dot each. It, uh, then we can actually just use it here. And let's uh, do that. So now, like that. Um, and then we need to actually, now that we've defined the region of interest we're looking for, we need to actually request it using what's called a region request. And one of my favorite features of IntelliJ is um, how it can smartly figure out import statements. So this is grayed out showing that it, it as of this moment, it doesn't know what this is. Um, it, it doesn't recognize region request. But if you just go to a brand new line and start typing regional crest and hit tab, uh, it finds what it assumes, what it thinks is the best import statement and imports uh, qpath.lib.regions.regional crest. And that is the one we're looking for. How convenient is that? So we're requesting that um, we're generally making a regional request. We're creating a specific instance of that request. Um, and uh, it wants to find the server. We haven't defined that yet, so I'm going to define it right here. And that's going to be server equals get current. Um, and I believe, yeah, uh, in the read the docs that had just been up at the very first um, line in this box. Uh, so if you can't remember where that comes from, it's always great to check read the docs. So it doesn't actually want the server, it wants the path, but that's fine. It's, it'll just figure that out. Uh, for the moment, I want a, um, a, a high resolution image with a down sample value of one. If you've chosen very large images, um, like full big tissue regions, you might want to increase the down sample value to uh, decrease the final file size. Um, and this is referencing the region of interest we've defined here. And then the final uh, function is just write image region using the server we defined up here, the uh, request we've defined here, and then path. So we're going to have to actually um, spend some time defining this path. Uh, first, let's make a folder where we're going to put all of these images. Um, we do that through build file path. And it's uh, there's a convenience, um, a, a hard coded convenience variable called project based directory. And this will find well, wherever your project is stored, which in this case, um, it is, uh, it's this folder. It's wherever, wherever this open directory project takes you. And then I'm going to make a subfolder inside of that called exports. Um, and this is going to be called export. Uh, this, uh, this exports folder does not yet exist, so we're going to have to create it, um, which I, I could just right now make the folder. Um, but I like to do that uh, based on scripting. That way, I can reuse this script in a, a different project without having to um, remember to manually make the folder. Um, and that command is make directories or make dirs and kders. Um, and you just call export folder. 
uh, this will make the folder if it does not yet exist, but if it already exists, it doesn't do anything and that'll just move on. So you don't have to worry about it accidentally deleting data. So that's the overall folder, um, but we still need to uh, give every file an individual name. Um, and since that's going to be done inside the loop, um, so I'm going to go def def um, sport name equals again. It's still build file path, and in this case, we can just call export folder to begin with, and it, it will it will take the um, the whole path up until that moment. Um, and then we need to figure out what the individual file is going to be called. And I think I want um, each file to be labeled with the name of the image and the name of the region. Um, that way we can differentiate the top to bottom. And if we're going to run this for a project, we can differentiate where the um, which image we're looking at. So to get the image name, it is get project entry dot get image. Um, cool. So, and that will get uh, Swiss roll HE. I think it does have the .czi at the end because that's part of the image name. And then I want an underscore. And then the annotation name, which is uh, it dot get name. Uh, and then right here. We need to give it a file type. Uh, so if I've done this right, and you know, we'll see. Uh, um, it should build a whole file path that is project-based directory slash exports slash Swissful HNE underscore region zero uh, dot tiff. I'm going to uh, put another line in here called print export name. Uh, that way, if I did it wrong, I can at least see where it thinks it's saving. And then instead of this hard-coded string that's just path to export, um, we're going to call it export name. Okay, let's see what happens. Control R for wrong. And okay, here's, that looks correct. And then let's open the project folder. Ooh, export folder exists, images exist. Huzzah. It actually did the thing. Uh, I only have one image here um, that's uh, relevant to this particular script, but you could easily go run run for project um, and select anything you want um, and then run this and it should work for all images and it shouldn't overwrite any data because we've inc included the whole image name in the export name. I'm going to be real honest here. I uh, practiced these scripts extensively before turning on the, the recording. And I already made sure that everything was going to work. I almost never get scripting right on the first try when I'm actually doing it for a project. I always have random errors and mis misspellings and um, incorrectly called variables and all of that. And uh, please don't feel bad if yours doesn't work on the first try. My never ever do. <laughs> this, this isn't my first try, it's my 10th. It's just the first one I recorded. Um, I want to point you to just a couple of more resources before before finishing up. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Read the Docs a few times, but this is definitely where I'd start, especially for people who have uh, never done Groovy scripting before. Um, there's a whole section on scripting that starts with how to go from uh, uh, a workflow to a more edited script um, and talks about uh, working, uh, running for project and all that. Um, and then it goes into how to make brand new scripts and some, just some helpful, helpful tips 
uh, there's a lot of resources out there on the internet for Groovy in general. There's a ton of websites that'll help you learn that. Um, but there's uh, this is all about the very QPath specific commands that don't exist anywhere else. Um, similarly, for more advanced users, uh, the QPath Java docs is very helpful. Uh, this is a good way of remembering syntax if you can't remember exactly which order the, the parameters are supposed to be in and things like that. Um, so for instance, you can just search right, right image and it will give you all of the different types of right image commands that exist. Um, and then you can click on it and it'll tell you it's expecting a server and then the uh, region request and then the path. So uh, if you've connected to IntelliJ, this will kind of come up automatically. If you haven't, it's all in the Java docs. And finally, uh, um, I just want to point you to this uh, paper by uh, Oliver, Olivier. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Burry. Um, it called uh, QPath, taking full control through workflows, scriptings, and extensions. Um, and this goes through, um, again, step-by-step step how to make a couple of uh, example scripts, how to start with the workflow history, edit it into something a little cleaner, um, and then start uh, creating your own uh, scripts from scratch. Um, and uh, this is just, it's very well documented. It's very, um, he, he did a really good job. I just, I'm a big fan of this paper. Um, uh, yes, full disclosure, one of the scripts he talks about is uh, something I had written and posted on the forum. Um, uh, so yeah, there's uh, lots of resources out there. And um, as always, I can't possibly talk about resources without mentioning the ImageSC forum, uh, the, all of the help 